Chapter Nine of Martin Eden by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine. Back from sea, Martin came, homing for California with a lover's desire. The store of money exhausted, he had shipped before the mast on the treasure-hunting schooner, and the Solomon Islands, after eight months of failure to find treasure, had witnessed the breaking up of the expedition. The men had been paid off in Australia and Martin immediately shipped on a deep-water vessel for San Francisco. Not alone had those eight months earned him enough money to stay on land for many weeks, but they had enabled him to do a great deal of studying and reading. His was the student's mind, and behind his ability to learn was the indomitability of his nature and his love for Ruth. The grammar he had taken along he went through again and again until his unjaded brain had mastered it, he noticed the bad grammar used by his shipmates, and made a point of mentally correcting and reconstructing their crudities of speech. To his great joy he discovered that his ear was becoming sensitive, and that he was developing grammatical nerves. A double negative jarred him like a discord, and often, from lack of practice, it was from his own lips that the jar came. His tongue refused to learn new tricks in a day. After he had been through the grammar repeatedly, he took up the dictionary and added twenty words a day to his vocabulary. He found that this was no light task, and at wheel or lookout he steadily went over and over his lengthening list of pronunciations and definitions, while he invariably memorized himself to sleep. Never did anything, if I were, and those things, were phrases with many variations, that he repeated under his breath in order to accustom his tongue to the language spoken by Ruth, and and ing, with the d and g pronounced emphatically, he went over thousands of times, and to his surprise he noticed that he was beginning to speak cleaner and more correct English than the officers themselves and the gentlemen adventurers in the cabin who had financed the expedition. The captain was a fishy-eyed Norwegian who somehow had fallen into possession of a complete Shakespeare which he never read and Martin had washed his clothes for him, and in return been permitted access to the precious volumes. For a time, so steeped was he in the plays, and in the many favorite passages that impressed themselves almost without effort on his brain, that all the world seemed to shape itself into forms of Elizabethan tragedy or comedy, and his very thoughts were in blank verse. It trained his ear and gave him a fine appreciation for noble English with all it introduced into his mind, much that was archaic and obsolete. The eight months had been well spent, and, in addition to what he learned of right speaking and high thinking, he had learned much of himself. Along with his humbleness because he knew so little, there arose a conviction of power. He felt a sharp gradation between himself and his shipmates, and was wise enough to realize that the difference lay in potentiality rather than achievement. What he could do, they could do, but within him he felt a confused ferment working that told him there was more in him than he had done. He was tortured by the exquisite beauty of the world, and wished that Ruth were there to share it with him. He decided that he would describe to her many of the bits of South Sea beauty. The creative spirit in him flamed up at the thought, and urged that he recreate this beauty for a wider audience than Ruth. And then, in splendor and glory, came the great idea. He would write. He would be one of the eyes through which the world saw, one of the ears through which it heard, one of the hearts through which it felt. He would write everything, poetry and prose, fiction and description, and plays like Shakespeare. There was career and the way to win Ruth. The men of literature were the world's giants and he conceived them to be far finer than the Mr. Butlers, who earned thirty thousand a year, and could be Supreme Court justices if they wanted to. Once the idea had germinated, it mastered him, and the return voyage to San Francisco was like a dream. He was drunken with unguessed power, and felt he could do anything. In the midst of the great and lonely sea he gained perspective. Clearly, and for the first time, he saw Ruth and her world, it was all visualized in his mind as a concrete thing which he could take up in his two hands and turn around and about and examine. 
There was much that was dim and nebulous in that world, but he saw it as a whole and not in detail, and he saw also the way to master it, to write. The thought was fire in him. He would begin as soon as he got back. The first thing he would do would be to describe the voyage of the treasure hunters. He would sell it to some San Francisco newspaper. He would not tell Ruth anything about it, and she would be surprised and pleased when she saw his name in print. While he wrote, he would go on studying. There were twenty-four hours in each day. He was invincible. He knew how to work, and the citadels would go down before him. He would not have to go to sea again, as a sailor. And for the instant he caught a vision of a steam yacht. There were other writers who possessed steam yachts. Of course, he cautioned himself, it would be slow succeeding at first, and for a time he would be content to earn enough money by his writing to enable him to go on studying. And then, after some time, a very indeterminate time, when he had learned and prepared himself, he would write the great things, and his name would be on all men's lips. But greater than that, infinitely greater and greatest of all, he would have proved himself worthy of Ruth. Fame was all very well, but it was for Ruth that his splendid dream arose. He was not a fame-monger, but merely one of God's mad lovers. Arrived in Oakland, with his snug payday in his pocket, he took up his old room at Bernard Higginbotham's and set to work. He did not even let Ruth know he was back. He would go and see her when he finished the article on the treasure hunters. It was not so difficult to abstain from seeing her, because of the violent heat of creative fever that burned in him. Besides, the very article he was writing would bring her nearer to him. He did not know how long an article he should write, but he counted the words in a double-page article in the Sunday supplement of the San Francisco Examiner, and guided himself by that. Three days at white heat completed his narrative, but when he had copied it carefully in a large scrawl that was easy to read, he learned from a rhetoric he had picked up in the library that there were such things as paragraphs and quotation marks. He had never thought of such things before, and he promptly set to work writing the article over, referring continually to the pages of the rhetoric, and learning more in a day about composition than the average schoolboy in a year. When he had copied the article a second time and rolled it up carefully, he read in a newspaper an item on hints to beginners, and discovered the iron law that manuscripts should never be rolled and that they should be written on one side of the paper. He had violated the law on both counts. Also, he learned from the item that first-class papers paid a minimum of ten dollars a column. So, while he copied the manuscript a third time, he consoled himself by multiplying ten columns by ten dollars. The product was always the same, one hundred dollars, and he decided that that was better than seafaring. If it hadn't been for his blunders, he would have finished the article in three days. One hundred dollars in three days! It would have taken him three months and longer on the sea to earn a similar amount. A man was a fool to go to sea when he could write, he concluded, though the money in itself meant nothing to him. Its value was in the liberty it would get him, the presentable garments it would buy him, all of which would bring him nearer, swiftly nearer, to the slender pale girl who had turned his life back upon itself and given him inspiration. He mailed the manuscript in a flat envelope and addressed it to the editor of the San Francisco Examiner. He had an idea that anything accepted by a paper was published immediately, and as he had sent the manuscript in on Friday, he expected it to come out the following Sunday. He conceived that it would be fine to let that event apprise Ruth of his return. Then, Sunday afternoon, he would call and see her. In the meantime, he was occupied by another idea which he prided himself upon as being a particularly sane, careful, and modest idea. He would write an adventure story for boys and sell it to the youth's companion. He went to the free reading room and looked through the files of the youth's companion. Serial stories, he found, were usually published in that weekly in five installments of about three thousand words each. He discovered several serials that ran to seven installments and decided to write one of that length. He had been on a whaling voyage in the Arctic once. 
a voyage that was to have been for three years, and which had terminated in shipwreck at the end of six months. While his imagination was fanciful, even fantastic at times, he had a basic love of reality that compelled him to write about the things he knew. He knew whaling, and out of the real materials of his knowledge he proceeded to manufacture the fictitious adventures of the two boys he intended to use as joint heroes. It was easy work, he decided on Saturday evening. He had completed on that day the first installment of three thousand words, much to the amusement of Jim, and to the open derision of Mr. Higginbotham, who sneered throughout mealtime at the literary person they had discovered in the family. Martin contented himself by picturing his brother-in-law's surprise on Sunday morning when he opened his examiner and saw the article on the treasure hunters. Early that morning he was out himself to the front door, nervously racing through the many-sheeted newspaper. He went through it a second time, very carefully, then folded it up and left it where he had found it. He was glad he had not told anyone about his article. On second thought he concluded that he had been wrong about the speed with which things found their way into newspaper columns. Besides, there had not been any news value in his article, and most likely the editor would write to him about it first. After breakfast he went on with his serial. The words flowed from his pen, though he broke off from the writing frequently to look up definitions in the dictionary or to refer to the rhetoric. He often read or reread a chapter at a time, during such pauses, and he consoled himself that while he was not writing the great things he felt to be in him, he was learning composition, at any rate, and training himself to shape up and express his thoughts. He toiled on till dark, when he went out to the reading room and explored magazines and weeklies until the place closed at ten o'clock. This was his program for a week. Each day he did three thousand words, and each evening he puzzled his way through the magazines, taking note of the stories, articles, and poems that editors saw fit to publish. One thing was certain. What these multitudinous writers did, he could do, and only give him time, and he would do what they could not do. He was cheered to read in book news, in a paragraph on the payment of magazine writers, not that Rudyard Kipling received a dollar per word, but that the minimum rate paid by first-class magazines was two cents a word. The youth's companion was certainly first class, and at that rate the three thousand words he had written that day would bring him sixty dollars, two months' wages on the sea. On Friday night he finished the serial, twenty-one thousand words long. At two cents a word, he calculated, that would bring him four hundred and twenty dollars, not a bad week's work. It was more money than he had ever possessed at one time. He did not know how he could spend it all. He had tapped a gold mine. Where this came from, he could always get more. He planned to buy some more clothes, to subscribe to many magazines, and to buy dozens of reference books that at present he was compelled to go to the library to consult. And still there was a large portion of the four hundred and twenty dollars unspent. This worried him until the thought came to him of hiring a servant for Gertrude and of buying a bicycle for Marion. He mailed the bulky manuscript to the youth's companion, and on Saturday afternoon, after having planned an article on pearl diving, he went to see Ruth. He had telephoned, and she went herself to greet him at the door. The old familiar blaze of health rushed out from him and struck her like a blow. It seemed to enter into her body and course through her veins in a liquid glow, and to set her quivering with its imparted strength. He flushed warmly as he took her hand and looked into her blue eyes, but the fresh bronze of eight months of sun hid the flush, though it did not protect the neck from the gnawing chafe of the stiff collar. She noted the red line of it with amusement, which quickly vanished as she glanced at his clothes. They really fitted him. It was his first made-to-order suit, and he seemed slimmer and better modeled. In addition, his cloth cap had been replaced by a soft hat which she commanded him to put on, and then complimented him on his appearance. She did not remember when she had felt so happy. This change in him was her handiwork, and she was proud of it and fired with ambition further to help him. But the most radical change of all, and the one that pleased her most, was the change in his speech. 
Not only did he speak more correctly, but he spoke more easily, and there were many new words in his vocabulary. When he grew excited or enthusiastic, however, he dropped back into the old slurring and the dropping of final consonants. Also, there was an awkward hesitancy at times, as he essayed the new words he had learned. On the other hand, along with his ease of expression, he displayed a lightness and facetiousness of thought that delighted her. It was his old spirit of humor and badinage that had made him a favorite in his own class, but which he had hitherto been unable to use in her presence through lack of words and training. He was just beginning to orientate himself and to feel that he was not wholly an intruder. But he was very tentative, fastidiously so, letting Ruth set the pace of sprightliness and fancy, keeping up with her but never daring to go beyond her. He told her of what he had been doing and of his plan to write for a livelihood and of going on with his studies. But he was disappointed at her lack of approval. She did not think much of his plan. You see, she said frankly, writing must be a trade like anything else. Not that I know anything about it, of course. I only bring common judgment to bear. You couldn't hope to be a blacksmith without spending three years at learning the trade. Or is it five years? Now writers are so much better paid than blacksmiths that there must be ever so many more men who would like to write, who try to write. But then, may I not be peculiarly constituted to write? He queried, secretly exulting at the language he had used, his swift imagination throwing the whole scene and atmosphere upon a vast screen, along with a thousand other scenes from his life, scenes that were rough and raw, gross and bestial. The whole composite vision was achieved with the speed of light, producing no pause in the conversation, nor interrupting his calm train of thought. On the train of his imagination he saw himself and this sweet and beautiful girl, facing each other and conversing in good English, in a room full of books and paintings and tone and culture, and all illuminated by a bright light of steadfast brilliance while ranged about and fading away to the remote edges of the screen were antithetical scenes, each scene a picture, and he the onlooker, free to look at will upon what he wished. He saw these other scenes through drifting vapors and swirls of sullen fog, dissolving before shafts of red and garish light. He saw cowboys at the bar, drinking fierce whiskey, the air filled with obscenity and ribald language and he saw himself with them drinking and cursing with the wildest, or sitting at table with them, under smoking kerosene lamps, while the chips clicked and clattered, and the cards were dealt around. He saw himself stripped to the waist with naked fists, fighting his great fight with Liverpool Red in the forecastle of the Susquehanna, and he saw the bloody deck of the John Rogers, that gray morning of attempted mutiny the mate kicking in death throes on the main hatch, the revolver in the old man's hand spitting fire and smoke, the men with passion-wrenched faces, of brutes screaming vile blasphemies and falling about him. And then he returned to the central scene, calm and clean in the steadfast light, where Ruth sat and talked with him amid books and paintings, and he saw the grand piano upon which she would play later to him and he heard the echoes of his own selected and correct words. But then may I not be peculiarly constituted to write. But no matter how peculiarly constituted a man may be for blacksmithing, she was laughing, I never heard of one becoming a blacksmith without first serving his apprenticeship. What would you advise? he asked. And don't forget that I feel in me this capacity to write. I can't explain it. I just know that it is in me. You must get a thorough education, was the answer, whether or not you ultimately become a writer. This education is indispensable for whatever career you select, and it must not be slipshod or sketchy. You must go to high school. Yes, he began, but she interrupted him with an afterthought. Of course you could go on with your writing, too. I would have to, he said grimly. Why? She looked at him, prettily puzzled for she did not quite like the persistence with which he clung to his notion. Because, without writing, there wouldn't be any high school. I must live and buy books and clothes, you know. I'd forgotten that, 
she laughed. Why weren't you born with an income? I'd rather have good health and imagination, he answered. I can make good on the income, but the other things have to be made good for. He almost said you, then amended his sentence too. Have to be made good for one. Don't say make good, she cried, sweetly petulant. It's slang, and it's horrid. He flushed and stammered. That's right, and I only wish you'd correct me every time. I, I'd like to, she said haltingly. You have so much in you that is good that I want to see you perfect. He was clay in her hands immediately, as passionately desirous of being molded by her as she was desirous of shaping him into the image of her ideal of man. And when she pointed out the opportuneness of the time, that the entrance examinations to high school began on the following Monday, he promptly volunteered that he would take them. Then she played and sang to him, while he gazed at hungry yearning at her, drinking in her loveliness, and marveling that there should not be a hundred suitors listening there, and longing for her as he listened and longed. End of chapter 9